Uh, committee uh, will come to uh, order. First, I'd like to uh, thank our witnesses uh, for joining us uh, here today. Today's uh, hearing will examine the state of federal procurement, consider ways to boost innovation in the procurement process, and address challenges that have uh, put a tremendous strain on federal contracting. A reliable and consistent procurement process is the key to ensuring that the federal government can effectively deliver its services to all Americans. Federal agencies uh, depend on procurement professionals to place contracts efficiently, to ensure that government needs are being met, and that taxpayer dollars are being used effectively. But we also need a process uh, that is innovative, and a process that's nimble enough to adapt to changing needs uh, and circumstances. In recent years, the amount of federal dollars spent on contracts has steadily increased. Driven in part by the need to acquire new technology, such as software, cloud computing, cybersecurity protections, and artificial intelligence. Products and services that we can only expect to become even more in demand as we move forward. At the same time, we face several challenges that have made the procurement process both difficult to manage and difficult to navigate for companies hoping to do business with the federal government. These challenges include a shortage of procurement professionals, particularly those with expertise related to emerging technologies, along with steep barriers for new companies seeking their first federal contract, and a diminishing domestic industrial base that can support the government's needs and requirements. Right now, procurement professionals are retiring at a higher rate than they can be replaced, which leaves few experienced staff available to train new recruits in the contracting field, and even fewer staff with the expertise and training needed to make increasingly complex technology purchases. I was pleased to work with Ranking Member Portman uh, on bipartisan legislation to create a training program to help federal employees responsible for purchasing and managing artificial intelligence technologies better understand their capabilities and their potential risk. But it's clear there is more we must do to ensure that the government is at the cutting edge of new developments and that taxpayers are getting the most uh, from their hard-earned taxpayer money. Frequently, agencies uh, are challenged to work at the speed of relevance uh, of the technology that they buy, and procurements that take years to complete cannot keep pace with the speed of technological developments. This leaves agencies with technology that is new to them, but may already be obsolete for the job ahead. A pool of federal contractors is also shrinking, particularly with regard to new and small companies. A recent GAO study of the Department of Defense contracting found that while DOD contracts with small businesses increased by 15%, the number of small businesses awarded those contracts decreased by almost half. A July 2021 Bipartisan Policy Center report noted similar concerns with the unique barriers the small businesses in particular face when trying to enter the federal contracting process. New small firms are a critical component for our industrial base pioneering new innovations, strengthening the resiliency of the domestic supply chains, and creating good-paying jobs in communities all across our country. I was proud to advance bipartisan legislation through this committee that was signed into law earlier this year called the Price Act, which ensures that small and disadvantaged business owners are given a fair opportunity to compete for federal contracts and continue to grow their companies. Today, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome a talented group of experts who can help us identify more effective solutions to address these ongoing challenges and ensure that the federal government is better able to serve the American people. So thank you to the three of you for being here. Uh, we look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Member Portman. You're recognized for your opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the witnesses as well, and particularly uh, Ms. Correa. Thank you for your many years of service uh, to the Department of Homeland Security. You were there at the inception, and congratulations um, on your retirement. Uh, the United States government spends a lot of money each year from the taxpayers on contracts for goods and services. In 2020, that was about $665 billion, a 50 percent increase from just 2015. Some of that increase was due to coronavirus. Uh, we understand that, but not all of it. 
We've got to wait and see what the contracting outcomes will be for this year as federal agencies contend with this skyrocketing inflation because it's likely that will, of course, drive the numbers up further. Procurement officials also face a lot of other challenges in the area, of course, of cybersecurity, which this committee spends a lot of time on, and also workforce uh, and the need to get more procurement officials into the government. I, I think we've got to uh, focus today on another issue, which is by America, because that's where this committee has, has taken a lead. Uh, we've got to do all we can do to protect American jobs, and that starts by ensuring that tax dollars spent on American government procurement uh, isn't used to create jobs overseas when it can be used to create jobs here. I'm grateful that one area um, that remains bipartisan uh, is this uh, Buy America and, and Made in America approach. It's been the law for nearly a century, but federal agencies have, in my view, granted too many waivers to Buy America. Under current law, federal agencies may use domestic content waivers to purchase goods or services from foreign companies uh, only in very limited circumstances. For example, when there's no American-made product available or it will significantly increase the cost. Federal agencies, however, in my view, overuse this waiver authority, and until recently there wasn't an easily accessible government-wide system tracking the use and the abuse of these waivers, so I'm pleased we've made progress on that. The bipartisan BuyAmerica.gov Act is now law. Uh, uh, that's my legislation with Senator Stabenow, which was part of the infrastructure bill, and the administration has now issued an executive order creating this public website, MadeInAmerica.gov, so I'm, I'm really pleased to see that which will help by, among other things, better identifying opportunities uh, for American companies uh, to be able to contract with the government. It mandates that any federal agency requesting a waiver to Made in America requirements publicly submit it for everyone to see. There are also uh, maybe American manufacturers unknown to government that can meet these needs, and that's what this website will be helpful to provide. Uh, that transparency is good for American jobs. I was also pleased to work with Chairman Peters on something called Build America by America, it's a title in the recently passed infrastructure bill as well. That title updated the Buy America requirements to ensure the money spent on infrastructure goes to American manufacturing and American workers. American Steel, as an example, some of which is made in Ohio. We also included the Make PPE in America Act, uh, part of that legislation that requires that personal protective gear, critical to responding to the public health crisis here at home, is made in America. We, we talked to PPE manufacturers about restoring production to America, the biggest thing we heard was we need long-term contracts to be able to make the investments, and that's in that legislation. The multi-year contracts, as required by the legislation, will give them the certainty they need to make these investments in the United States. Having passed all these laws, uh, we might say uh, that 2021 was the year of Buy America. Uh, these are really historic changes, uh, particularly in the infrastructure bill, and this committee should be proud of the work it's done on a bipartisan basis uh, to improve these programs. Again, I thank the witnesses for being here. We look forward to your comments today uh, and your ideas on improving the federal procurement system further and making the government a smarter buyer on behalf of the American people. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Portman. Uh, it is uh, the practice of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee to uh, swear in witnesses. So uh, if each of you would please stand and, and raise your, your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony that you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. You may be seated. Our first witness is uh, Soraya Correa. Uh, Ms. Correa currently serves as President and Chief Executive Officer of the Soraya Correa and Associates, LLC, and was the former Chief Procurement Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. While, a, while, a, while at DHS, uh, Ms. Correa was recognized for her advancement of acquisition innovation through the creation of the Procurement Innovation Lab, now regarded as a model within government. She has also served more than 40 years in federal service at agencies such as the Naval Sea Systems Command, GSA, NASA, and DHS since its very inception. She was awarded the Presidential Rank Award for Distinguished Service in 2018 and has spoken widely on acquisition topics, including acquisition reform and securing the supply chain. Welcome, Ms. Correa. It is great to have you here. You may proceed with your opening remarks. Sir, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and other distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss procurement innovation. After over 40 years of, of dedicated federal service in the acquisition profession, I retired in July 2021 as the Chief Procurement Officer and Senior Procurement Executive at the Department of Homeland Security. 
My career spans several federal agencies and positions as both a procurement and program official. Today, I operate a small business supporting the acquisition process through the advice and consultation to professional associations, industry, and academia. My commitment to the profession and the improvement of the procurement process is demonstrated through the programs and initiatives I implemented at DHS. Speak to any acquisition leader and they will highlight the challenge of recruiting, hiring, and retaining a well-trained and experienced workforce. To address the challenge, the federal government needs to invest in the growth and development of the acquisition workforce. By that, I mean create programs and initiatives to promote the profession, deliver the right training at the right time, and ensure career paths are clear. One area where we can improve is in creating consistency across the profession when it comes to certification standards and promoting the use of a common language for the profession. By doing so, we can make acquisition careers more transferable between government and industry and as a result, grow the profession. I believe that the use of a common language will also make it easier for academic institutions to offer degree programs and for individuals to understand and appreciate the profession. However, certification and training is not enough. We need to develop the soft skills and provide on-the-job learning opportunities. While this is nothing new, I believe that today's acquisition professional needs to know how to communicate, collaborate, and cooperate with others, and they need to be inquisitive, risk-tolerant, and decisive. The best way to gain these skills is through on-the-job training where they can learn by doing. The establishment of intern programs is one of the many ways in which agencies can develop and grow their workforce, while simultaneously providing technical, interpersonal, and leadership training. At DHS, we established the Acquisition Professionals Career Program to attract, train, and hire acquisition professionals. We also created a mentoring program for procurement personnel. Finally, we encouraged rotational job assignments and participation in specialized training and certification programs such as the Digital Information Technology Acquisition Professionals Program. Such initiatives create an environment where indiv individuals feel appreciated and valued. I established the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab to inspire and motivate the acquisition workforce to put forth ideas on how we could simplify the procurement process, enhance outcomes, and, assure, and ensure a more efficient and effective uh, experience for industry and government. My goal was not to seek changes to statute or regulation, but to identify and use all the flexibilities available in the federal acquisition regulation. Our process was designed to test the innovation or idea and share what we learned across the acquisition community. Since then, several agencies have created procurement innovation organizations. Many of the innovative practices and techniques developed by the PIL and other agencies are found on the periodic table of acquisition innovations, which is hosted on the Federal Acquisition Institute website. Encouraging organizations to promote procurement innovation and sharing what they learn is essential to improving the process. Several agencies are also using artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, and other technologies to promote efficiency in procurement processes and enhance the customer experience. Such efforts need to be encouraged and shared across the federal agencies. While at DHS, I implemented discussion forums for traditional and non-traditional contractors to learn about DHS and share with us technologies, approaches, and innovations. Two of the most popular were the Strategic Industry Conversation and the Reverse Industry Day. At the Strategic Industry Conversation, officials shared with industry the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead. The Reverse Industry Day was a unique forum for industry to educate us on their business practices. Topics included what goes into preparing a proposal, why do companies protest, and how to buy certain technologies. These events, these events provide information and generate ideas for improving processes and removing barriers to competition. I recommend we encourage agencies to create or participate in such events. In addition to exploring the flexibilities in the FAR, at DHS we had success in using special procurement authorities, including other transaction authority and the Commercial Solutions Opening Pilot Program, to acquire innovative technologies and solutions. These authorities provide greater flexibility in the drafting of the contractual agreement since they are not subject to the FAR and enable organizations to acquire products and services from new or non-traditional contractors with specialized knowledge and expertise. I ask that you consider making such authorities permanent and expand these authorities for use by the CFO Act agencies. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. I remain committed to the success of our federal government and the acquisition profession. I take this opportunity to express appreciation for my colleagues in government, industry, and academia, and a special thank you to the committee for seeking solutions and providing the support this profession deserves. I look forward to your questions, sir. Thank you, uh, Ms. Correa, for your, uh, for your comments. Our, our next witness is uh, Grant Schneider. Mr. Schneider currently serves as the Senior Director of Cybersecurity Services at Venerable LLP 
and served as the former U.S. Chief uh, Information Security Officer based out of the White House. Mr. Schneider led the establishment of the Federal Acquisition Security Council, an interagency body responsible for overseeing information and communications technology supply chain risk management for the federal government as its first chair. He also held positions leading cybersecurity at the National Security Council and acquisition-related positions in IT resource management at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Mr. Snyder, welcome to the committee. You may proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, members of the committee and your staff, thank you for the privilege to appear before you today. Um, as mentioned, I have spent my entire 30-year career focused on our nation's security. This includes over 20 years at the Defense Intelligence Agency, seven of which as the Chief Information Officer. I then spent six years at the Executive Office of the President, um, including serving as a <coughs> Senior Director for Cybersecurity Policy on the National Security Council staff, and most recently as the Federal Chief Information Security Officer. For the past 20 months, I've been a Senior Director of Cybersecurity Services at the law firm Venable, where I help our clients, both large and small companies from across all sectors, enhance their cybersecurity programs through the development of and implementation of risk management strategies, as well as assisting with the preparation, response, and recovery from cybersecurity incidents, including ransomware. I also have helped many clients who are struggling to navigate the acquisition and compliance regimes necessary to do business with the federal government. I want to thank the committee for taking up the important issues related to the timely acquisition of goods and services by the government. My first exposure to the procurement was in the mid-1990s when I was a GS-8 or 9. I was the D Defense Intelligence Agency's representative to a global contract for IT services to support the um, defense intelligence community. And I met the Air Force representative who was a colleague and would-be mentor. One day we were working on the program and I made the comment that uh, there was something in the contract that gave us great leverage over the contractor and which was going to be a great deal for the government. The Air Force representative looked at me and said, look, son, the point of the contract is to create an environment where the government and industry can work together to accomplish and solve agency mission needs. It's not there for us to beat each other uh, over the head about. Through that program, I experienced the mission success possible from a partnership between contracting officers, technologists, and the vendors <clears throat> Unfortunately, many of the people I have met throughout my career still view government contracts as an adversarial tool rather than a collaborative opportunity. Federal agencies, like nearly all organizations today, are dependent on technology to develop and deliver critical services in support of our nation. While these digital enhancements increase productivity, convenience, and access to services, they also present opportunities for malicious cyber actors who have demonstrated a willingness to exploit any system to achieve their objectives. This evolution to a more digital experience means federal information technology investments are more critical than ever before. And as previously mentioned, the federal government invests a lot of money in information technology, over $90 billion a year. Most of that money is spent on goods and services acquired through federal procurement processes. Federal agencies need agility within the procurement system to leverage the innovative tools, technologies, and services available from the private sector. Here are some actions I think government can take to enhance procurement innovation. One, provide greater flexibilities for contracting officers to prioritize the mission needs of the government during procurement. This includes recognizing that time to market is a key metric for every acquisition. Two, establish strong partnerships between technology and acquisition professionals. I recommend creating joint teams of acquisition and technology individuals who can focus on mission delivery to address agencies' most pressing technology procurement needs. Three, Develop procurement vehicles that allow for technical refresh throughout their life cycle so new technologies can be made available to agencies without necessitating new procurement processes. Four, consider supply chain risks associated with goods and services in technology acquisitions. This includes the quality and provenance of the items being procured as well as the trustworthiness of the provider. 
Additionally, the government should take steps to ensure there is a trusted marketplace available for public and private sector acquisitions. And fifth, drive consistent compliance and security requirements across the Department of Defense and federal civilian agencies' acquisition processes. DOD and civilian agencies are seeking many of the same innovative commodity technologies available in the private sector. However, divergence in compliance requirements increases costs to the private sector to develop and provide solutions to both communities. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Our uh, final witness is Elizabeth Sullivan. Uh, Ms. Sullivan currently serves as president of Madison Services Group, a government relations firm focusing on government contracting, and leads various groups representing both small and mid-sized com contractors. She recently led the formation of the Secure Supply Chain Consortium, a group of small and mid-sized federal contractors that advise decision makers on difficult supply chain security problems, such as recent efforts to restrict procurement of certain information and telecommunications equipment from China, and the Department of Defense's Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Ms. Sullivan, welcome to our committee. Uh, you may proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you. Chair Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Elizabeth Sullivan, and I'm president of Madison Services Group. MSGI advocates on behalf of many segments of the small and mid-sized federal contracting community. I'm here today to discuss a key component of our procurement system, small businesses. At MSGI, we believe practical business problems require practical policy solutions. I would like to thank the chair for spearheading the Bipartisan Price Act. This new law addresses the need for modernizing the federal acquisition system and will be transformative for small business contractors around the country. It tackles one of the barriers to procurement innovation, effective utilization of small businesses. Let me just say up front, a common misconception is that small companies believe they will just be given awards by the federal government. This is simply not true. Small businesses just want a fair shot to compete. The federal procurement system adds additional layers of complexity. This is not to say that all acquisition regulations are problematic. However, a number of them should be streamlined. Challenges arise not just from the content of the rules, but how the rules are promulgated. For example, the time lapse between FAR Council action and final rules published by the SBA can span up to seven or more years, causing confusion for all involved. I urge this committee to require the FAR Council to issue its rulemaking simultaneously with the SBA. The committee has expressed concern about the health of the industrial base, and for good reason. On average, the federal market loses 5% of small business entrants every fiscal year. Small companies are not just valuable prime contractors, but often serve as subcontractors to large businesses. Since the government does not have a relationship with subcontractors, these companies have very little leverage to remedy any problems that arise. Further, category management has accelerated the decline in diversity of vendors with large dollar amounts held only by a few companies. Nearly one in every four federal contract dollars is spent through large multiple award contracts. As the focus of government spending shifts more towards innovation, small IT vendors play an important part in this ecosystem. Hampering their success, outdated NAICS codes inhibit their ability to win work. In addition, how agencies determine best value can also prove to be problematic for small businesses. Best value doesn't always mean lowest price, and despite past congressional efforts, agencies are still using LPTA for many contracts. Small business offices at federal agencies play an outsized role in supporting small business participation. Our experience is that they are under-resourced and cannot give individual attention to all the small businesses that request it. Yet, agencies have been tasked with increasing the number of new contractors. Additionally, there is not enough attention given to understanding small business programs across government. I know firsthand that many women-owned companies spend a great deal of time explaining the WSB program to contracting officers. Speaking of new entrants, the government relies on strong past performance when awarding a contract. Many times these requirements can result in a chicken and egg situation. The company can only get past performance by performing on a contract, but not, cannot be awarded a contract unless they have past performance. 
A recent attempt at solving this issue was proposed on the new GSA Polaris procurement. The solicitation allowed small companies to rely on the past performance of the large company on their team. While good for new entrants, on the flip side, allowing this use of past performance could also hurt more mature small businesses. I would be remiss if I didn't point out the uncertainty in cybersecurity requirements that loom over small businesses. With the constantly evolving cyber standards for government contractors, it can be challenging to remain compliant. I would encourage this committee to evaluate civilian agency requirements, ensuring that they do not conflict with new DOD standards. In conclusion, small businesses are only asking for a fair chance to compete. Strengthening agency focus on small business programs, eliminating rulemaking discrepancies, shifting the buying environment away from category management, and clarifying government-wide cybersecurity requirements builds resiliency of the industrial base. The topic today is of utmost importance to continuing COVID recovery and securing a sustainable, innovative acquisition environment. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you for uh, your opening comments. And actually, I'm going to want to pick up uh, on the comments you made with, with small businesses and, and ask a question of all three of you. But I'll, I'll have uh, Ms. Correa uh, start, and then you can elaborate more on your uh, as, as the final word uh, in this question. Because I hear it all the time uh, from small businesses are saying, we, we can't get it. I was just at a forum at Wayne State University earlier this week, and particularly with minority businesses, they're saying we can't get contracts because we have to first show that we are really, that we uh, have done well uh, with a contract that we can't get, uh, so it's impossible to actually uh, get one. And I, I think all of you agree that there's incredible innovation and, in, and um, dynamism in our small business sector, and we want to help those businesses grow and prosper. So my question to each of you, and we'll let you have the last word, Ms. Sullivan, because you uh, brought up this issue in your opening comments, so just elaborate on uh, how can we remove this barrier? How, how can we expand opportunities uh, for small businesses to, to get uh, these contracts and to stabilize their business and provide great services to the federal government? So it's all in the evaluation, sir, and that's a great question. It's all in the evaluation of the proposals. There is an inherent desire to try to rely on past performance and experience. Um, what I've always said is experience is good depending on what it is you need it for. If you need a brain surgeon, you probably want them to have experience. If you're buying technology, you're probably not going to have a lot of experience because technology is changing on a recurring basis. So instead of focusing so much on experience and past performance, I've always recommended let's test them. Let's bring them in, have them demonstrate what they do. Have them come talk to us, similar to what you do with interviewing a person. A lot of the techniques that we developed through the Procurement Innovation Lab were designed to do just that, to create greater confidence in the evaluators by having the opportunity to meet with companies, talk to them, perhaps test them, or have them come in and demonstrate how they would accomplish the work in the solicitation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think in addition to the testing, I love that idea, is recognizing past performance done in a commercial setting. So past performance in government is not necessarily unique, and I agree it's a lot about the evaluation, and often the criteria is written so specific that you have to have had past performance, perhaps even at the in a bureau level within an agency, in order to even be considered for the acquisition, whereas past performance in commercial settings would also be perfectly acceptable. And I think that build, you know, builds off the idea that we shouldn't confuse new entrants in the federal market with new companies. I think that that's a lot of the time what the acquisition workforce thinks of, right, with small businesses, oh, they must have just started the business. A lot of these are very successful commercial companies. Um, I do think, to address what you had said, Senator, having goals to that are internal to the agency to kind of move the needle for new entrants. That can be a way to incentivize agencies to, you know, utilize these new entrants that may not have the past performance. Um, and also, I think the Small Business Administration, their district offices, could be really powerful feeders for non-traditional, you know, contractors that come to them and connect them to different agencies that, you know, might have those specific mission needs that need to be met. All right, thank you. Ms. Correa, I understand that uh, recruiting and retention and procurement staff is uh, clearly a chief concern among uh, federal agencies uh, all across the board. With procurements becoming ever more complex, we, we need trained, we need experienced uh, workforce, and 
I understand agencies are continually recruiting contracting officers from each other in an, an attempt to maintain staffing, a little bit of poaching going on uh, back and forth. My question to you is how can the federal government ensure that it has enough trained professionals? What, what, what do we need to be doing now? And what do we need to be doing differently? Thank you, that's a, a magnificent question. It's something that I'm passionate about. First, we gotta put the right leadership in place. People who really understand the profession, understand what makes people tick and are willing to support their individuals. They're supposed to champion this workforce and enable them to take the right risks and do the right thing. But the most important thing that I would emphasize is helping people understand what this profession is really about. People don't always come into this profession because what they read about is the bad news stories that are out there in the press. They don't hear about the good news, the things that we do very well, including the lives that we save through the procurements that we make, the things that we do to enable the mission. We talk about procurement in terms of contracting and administrative processes, and we don't talk about the fact that what procurement does is enable the mission. We buy the products and services that our first responders, our war fighters, and others use. So we need to learn, learn how to talk to people. The other thing that I would say is we got to get into the colleges, the universities, and I dare say high schools, and start talking about the profession. We need to bring in people at the very beginning, help them see the career path and understand what this mission is. I came into the government as a clerk typist, and I took my first procurement job at the Department of Navy, and I was hooked. I was hooked because my job was diving and salvage, and it was about people's lives and the livelihood of people, and I've never forgotten what mission is about. We need to talk that way, we need to promote the right leadership in the organization, and we, to, we need to create programs. I talked about intern programs. Intern programs are a great way to bring people on board and educate them. And I do think we need to cross-train people. It's important. I took the opportunity to go into the program side, program management, and work in IT for a while. So I understand what IT is and how they think and what they look at and what program of officials think. So in short, I would say we got to invest in the profession, and I do mean invest. Invest in training, invest in recruiting, but most importantly, we got to get the right leaders in place to go out there and talk to people and bring them in. And by the way, it wasn't a little bit of poaching. It was a lot of poaching. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that. Well, good. Thanks for that clarification uh, <laughs> there. Let me pick up on the cross-training aspect. Uh, Mr. Snyder, with, with your own experience as a technical expert uh, working on the procurement team, uh, what, what are your thoughts about cross-training? Should we be doing more of that IT knowledge uh, with uh, folks with procurement background? Um, I, yes, I, I think what we should be realistic in what that's going to get us. I think in general, you know, it's going to get us awareness and it's going to help people from each community who are cross-trained kind of issue spot and recognize issues and be able to, to adapt and react to them. But I think we really need the collaborative teams working together, both focused on the mission outcomes that Soraya talked about to really be able to A, have that you know, interest in the, the agency outcomes and be able to, to learn from each other at a more organic level than kind of awareness training will do. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to need uh, to step away uh, briefly. I've uh, got an armed services committee going on downstairs. I'll be asking some questions, so I'll temporarily pass the gavel over to Senator Carper. Uh, but before Senator Carper gets that gavel, I'll recognize Ranking Member Portman for his questions. Thank goodness, because you never know once Carper gets that gavel, what he might do with it. Uh, I've seen him in action. Um, so thank you all again for, for, for your work on the procurement front. Uh, not always, as, as Ms. Correa kind of suggested, you know, the, the best image. Uh, people think uh, procurement and sometimes uh, their eyes kind of glaze over. I taught a course in procurement uh, when I left the Office of Management and Budget. and. Many of my students' eyes sort of glazed over. But by the end of the course, I think they understood that it, it really is essential, uh, both for the proper use of our taxpayer dollars, and also you can do you know, amazing things uh, for these small businesses in particular, uh, when given an opportunity to work with government. And obviously, we want the best, uh, best for uh, the services that we provide. One of the programs that I have concerns about is called FedRAMP. It's basically uh, kind of a preclearance program for cloud services. And Mr. Schneider, you know a lot about this. Um, I think it has weaknesses that make it vulnerable to foreign-based threats targeting our cloud systems. Uh, that would include China and Russia, by the way, in terms of some of these threats. The Senate unanimously passed our bill called Strengthening American Cybersecurity Act, which would address 
some of these issues. Mr. Schneider, have you looked at that legislation and do you think it would be helpful? So I'm not intimately familiar with the legislation. Um, however, I certainly agree with you that the FedRAMP program has some very good intentions. Um, it certainly has some room for improvement there. And I think that we have to consider supply chain risk management um, in all our acquisitions, whether it's for cloud services or, or any other mm -hmm. services that we're getting, and, and really come up with consistent ways that we can evaluate a vendor, again, for quality of product and trustworthiness of the vendor themselves and potentially any you know, legal uh, you know, oversight that their host country uh, could put upon them. I think, it's, I think it's really important that we have these reforms to, to protect these cloud-based systems, and my hope is the House will take it up and, and, and it be properly implemented. Um, what do GSA and FedRAMP programs need to do to attract small and innovative technology companies to become FedRAMP certified and to provide services to the federal government? So I, I think the struggle with small um, businesses and working to help some small businesses go through that process, uh, it, it's a very intensive and cost uh, expensive, intensive and, and expensive uh, you know, process to get through that has a lot of compliance. And so I think, A, uh, the program office at GSA uh, needs to be bigger. It needs to be better resourced to be able to, to work with more companies. Um, I think they need to seek ways to reduce the burden and reduce the amount of paperwork associated. I think mm -hmm. it also goes to being able to evaluate companies for their security outcomes um, as opposed to just for their security paperwork um, and you know the, the processes. They certainly need to have processes in place, uh, but we need more flexibility on how you can meet the security outcomes uh, for all businesses, small and large. Okay. Well, that's, that's one of our, uh, our goals here, and uh, my hope is that this legislation can pass to help protect the cloud-based services, but also we can expand uh, the number of companies that are um, innovative technology companies that will uh, provide that service. On the Buy America laws, we talked about it in my opening statement quite a bit, but bottom line is, you know, we're spending more and more money on um, goods being manufactured uh, around uh, the country, but also $34 billion was spent on goods manufactured by foreign firms in the last five years, Department of Defense largest purchaser of manufactured goods in the world, has spent over $200 billion on foreign products since 2007. And of course, we've lost manufacturing jobs during that time period. Um, so Ms. Correa, talk about that a little bit if you would. And, and maybe one thing that would be interesting, I think, for people to hear is what steps does a contracting officer go through in determining whether or not to apply for a waiver of our, of our Buy America laws? Sure, certainly, thank you. Thank you for the question. So the Buy American Act is a little bit, it's a, it's a little bit challenging because you have to look at it in conjunction with other legislation such as the National Trade, the, the Trade Agreements Act and a couple of other legislations. Generally speaking, what a contracting officer has to do is first of all, they gotta make sure they're incorporating the right clauses in the contract, but they also have to look at the product and determine if that product is available by American manufacturers. That's done in a number of ways. They can publish it out in, in, the, uh, in the federal biz ops, um, the publication that tells contractors that we're interested in certain products or services. Typically what agencies do on an annual basis is identify all those products that they buy from foreign manufacturers and publish them so that companies out there can tell us if they can make those products or if they're interested in selling those products to the government. What I've seen is that typically what when certain agencies are buying things like aircraft parts, parts of ships, it depends what engine they bought. And if that engine was bought by a foreign manufacturer, then you're probably going to have to buy the parts from that manufacturer. Mm -hmm. That's what I've typically seen. At DHS, one of the things that I did to improve compliance with Buy American Act, and I did this probably about six years ago when I was well into the job, was I raised the threshold for review. Instead of leaving it at the head of contracting level, it came to my level to review any waivers for Buy American Act. And that seemed to cut down the number of the waivers, but it also made us more conscious of what people were buying and how they were buying. But generally speaking, the process is they do have to look to see if there are American manufacturers out there. They do have to announce that they intend to buy this product, 
from company XYZ, whoever they may be, so that companies can come in and tell us if they manufacture the, pro manufacture the product. Yeah. I do want to add that I think some of the recent efforts that OMB has undertaken to take a closer look at Buy American uh, compliance, I think those processes will work. I think a compliance varies by agencies based on what they buy and how they buy. Yeah. Well, as I said earlier, 2021 was sort of Buy America year. We had historic reforms to Buy America Act and expanding it. And again, I'm pleased that the executive order has been issued with regard to buyamerica.gov, the website, which is kind of a clearinghouse. As you say, that's needed to let people know both on the private side what the opportunities are, but also to let government contractors know, uh, contracting officers, procurement officers, that there is a business out there that, that can provide this. Sometimes that's lost. Uh, do you think that the transparency and the the clearinghouse element of uh, America.gov can be successful in expanding the use of U.S. manufacturers? Yes, I do believe that it can be successful, but I also think we have to do something a little bit more practical, and that is we need to get out there and talk to industry. We need to go out and understand why industry perhaps is not interested in selling certain products or mm -hmm. manufacturing certain products in support of, of government needs. Um, a lot of times it has to do with the lack of guarantees in the contracts. I think Elizabeth mentioned that in her, in her testimony that, that sometimes these contracts, the way they're written, the company doesn't know when they're gonna recover their costs, if they're gonna recover their costs. And there are upfront investments the companies have to make if they're gonna go into the manufacturing of certain products. Mm -hmm. So I think that's extremely important. And this all ties back to something that Grant said, and that is we gotta build cohesive teams that plan the procurement properly, that think about all these factors, whether it's cybersecurity, FedRAMP certification, Buy American, when you build that team up front and you put it on the front end of the equation, you're going to write a much better solicitation, you're going to engage in a much better procurement process, and you're probably going to be bringing industry in a lot earlier to talk about what you're yeah. thinking about doing so they can get some input. So I'm and, a huge advocate of the coordinated teams, but yeah. you've got to get them up front. And expediting the process so that yes. it moves more quickly uh, yes. because we're moving at uh, faster and faster speeds in our economy. And particularly with inflation, we've got, we've got a real challenge right now to ensure we're spending that tax third hour most efficiently. Um, Senator Carper, when I, I taught this procurement class, it was at uh, The Ohio State University uh, at the Glenn School, now Glenn College, <laughs> your alma mater, uh, and f named after the former chairman of this committee, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I O. <laughs> I'm a Navy Watsi midshipman, Ohio State graduate. Graduated in 68 at the height of the Vietnam War, and had over there to do three tours later on. So. Happy to be here to serve with uh, Senator Portman and our colleagues. I, um, I, I just want to start first. This first question is sort of lighthearted, but uh, I, uh, uh, I'd remind you all that you're under oath. And uh, uh, Ms. Gray, uh, 40, years, oh, 40 years or more in service, and Mr. Schneider, I think 30 or more, I mean, were um, you're hiring all those years ago in violation of child labor laws <laughs> of this country. <laughs> I wish, though. No. <laughs> no, sadly not. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, whenever, whenever we, uh, first of all, it's a great hearing. It would be wonderful to come and join us. On a, on a panel like this, where there, was, sometimes we have witnesses, where it's an adversarial in, in, in environment, and, and we just kind of go at it with, the, with each other. But not the case here. I think there's a fair amount of consensus. And I would just uh, start, start with you, Ms. Correa, but uh, it was one or two examples where you think this panel actually agrees on, on, on ideas that we really ought to uh, take to heart. Would you just give us one or two uh, great, uh, great ideas for consensus? So I, I believe in investing in the acquisition workforce. That's the most important thing. Um, if we don't invest in the people, you can't fix the process. The people will fix the process. I stood up the Procurement Innovation Lab. I think that's the right way to go. And what we have to do is develop these people so they become the kind of leaders that say, we're going to champion what you do. We're going to stand with you, and we're going to let you take certain risks, and we're going to support you. And understanding that when you take risks, that means that we might fail once or twice. Mm. But failure can be a good thing because we learn from failure. We get up, we dust ourselves off, we figure it out and try again. And that's what I encouraged in my office and that's what I talked about. And I rewarded people who took risks even when it didn't go well. I gave them awards and I recognized them for trying something new. The other thing that I would say is the authorities, the flexibilities in the federal acquisition regulation. There are many there. 
We just have to understand them and we have to be able to interpret them. We have to learn to talk to one another. Often I hear procurement personnel say, the lawyer wouldn't let me do it. I never had a lawyer stop me from doing anything I wanted to do. I knew how to talk to them. I knew how to approach them and say, here's what we're trying to do, get me there. Um, and then the last thing that I would say. I like to say no finds, no means find another way. <laughs> and then the other thing that I did also was I stood up for the position that I was in. It was my job to ultimately make the decision. The lawyers are there to advise. So sometimes I was willing to take the risk, document the file on that risk and move on. And I think these are the kinds of things that we need to be encouraging in the workforce. The partnerships with the program offices, I was very candid with my program offices when I thought they were trying to do something that wasn't going to work, but I tried to give them options to understand what was available. But the most important thing we can do is put the right leaders in, invest in this acquisition workforce, get them as young as we can. Look at me. I came in as a little kitten. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but bring them in as young as we can. Let's go to start talking to them at high school. Let them think about a career in acquisition. And I think promoting a common lexicon, a common way of describing the profession and what we do so that industry and government can share in resources. There are a lot of brilliant people in industry that I brought into the government, and there are a lot of brilliant people in government that went out to industry. Mm. And I think that's an important thing to do. Good. Important. Mr. Schneider, thank you very much for all that. Mr. Schneider, do you agree with anything that Ms. Correa has said? Yeah, I, I really agree with the, um, the flex many flexibilities exist in the FAR today. Whenever people ask me about acquisition reform, and if you tell them you want a particular thing, it probably exists. The challenge is, quite frankly, finding a contracting officer or a team who feels empowered to leverage and implement and use some of those flexibilities. And so I think we need to talk to contracting officers and to the teams about their role with risk management as opposed to their personal liability if they decide to leverage one of those flexibilities and how they're going to have to explain it to an IG or to GAO um, after the fact. And so you know, some ability to go to their leadership, hopefully someone as wonderful as Soraya, who's gonna support them and support their ability to focus on the mission needs, I think is absolutely critical. All right, good, thanks. Ms. Sullivan, do you agree with anything that either of these two people have said? I agree with both of my fellow panelists. I think the empowerment is really important, especially with respect to utilizing small businesses. Um, DHS is a fantastic example of an agency who is willing to engage with small businesses to use those innovative solutions where a lot of times, you know, agencies just won't. I would say on the use of other authorities such as OTAs that was mentioned, um, something that might be of interest is figuring out how are small businesses able to access consortia? Are there any barriers there? If Congress could look into that, I think that that would be really useful to help see if we can get more small businesses um, contracts via those, you know, flexible authorities. All right, thank you. Uh, let me uh, stay with, uh, no, let me go back to Mr. Schneider uh, for this question. I think I have time maybe for one more. Um, uh, as you know, there's critical need. We've been talking about the, the the need to modernize information technology systems uh, across the federal agencies for as long as I've been here, we've been talking about this, and, 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 to, and to some extent doing it. It's important both to improve the uh, security of our systems and to ensure that the federal government can serve our, the public, the people we work for more effectively, more efficiently. From your perspective, what are the greatest challenges? From your perspective, what are the greatest challenges to agencies and their components successfully investing in technology modernization efforts? Senator, that, it's a great question, and, and I think, I feel like I've been chasing that much of my career, um, and to your point, I think there have been lots of successes. However, technology modernization is something we never achieve. Um, it's something we're always going to be moving towards, and I think one of the, the opportunities we have today, and, and certainly as Senator Portman mentioned, there's some risks with, with cloud capabilities, and we need to understand the security risks there. As agencies move towards cloud technologies, they're no longer buying the next decade's legacy system. They're actually moving to a system where industry that has and brings a lot of capability and innovation is going to do the evolution and the, the sustainment and the, the modernization of kind of the underlying technologies and the government can work towards just having to modernize at more the application layer. So I think there's some opportunities moving forward, uh, but, but it also is gonna take agencies 
to make some trade-offs and to decide to kill some systems that just need to go away um, and should no longer be continued to be sustained. Part of, uh, part of what you said uh, reminds me of the preamble of the Constitution. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, it doesn't say perfect, it says more perfect. And the idea we realize that uh, we're, uh, we have all these places where we can do better. And the idea is to move toward that more perfect uh, union or more perfect uh, approach to technology. Um, I think um, Senator Peterson, I understand he's in the route to the airport to fly back to Michigan. And so I get to chair this committee now for the next several weeks. And, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to yield back to <laughs> Senator Portman uh, for whatever he would like to ask her or say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you chair so many committees, I don't know if you, you'd have time to, to chair another. Um, with regard to workforce, you know, we, we talked earlier about the challenge that you're facing, and uh, let's face it, uh, pretty much every sector of our economy is facing it right now, the private sector uh, and public sector. And uh, with unemployment at under 3 percent and competition for talented workers being more intense than ever, I'm concerned that the federal government is going to have even a harder time hiring individuals with private sector experience to help the acquisition system work better because I think it's very helpful to have uh, the private sector coming in and helping our government to be able to recruit uh, people who understand the needs on both sides of the of the table, you know, the private sector uh, companies that we want to uh, engage more in procurement and the, and the government side. So my question to you would, would, would be this, um, what can we do uh, to make sure that we are competitive? You know, what could we do better? Ms. Correa, why don't you start off, since you've been um, looking at this question over, over many years, and you've seen times when it's easier and times when it's harder. So that's a great question, and I, and I want to mention first, the hiring process is, is painful, and I think you've heard that yep. before from other sides of the House, from the HR folks uh, in government. We got to modernize our hiring process. It takes too long to hire people. I literally had to authorize over hires, meaning telling my folks, hire in excess of the budget, meaning go out and recruit people because we know we're going to lose people. That way we have people sitting on the bench ready to come in. I shouldn't have to do that. I should be able to run a process where I can go and pick up people. I meet a talent individual. I should be able to go up and say, hey, Elizabeth, come join my team. Here's what you apply for. Let's look at this resume and let's get her on board. We don't move that fast. Even with direct hire authority, you'll hear about yep. direct hire authority. You have to go through a lot of rules and reports and statistics just to justify using that authority that's been given to us. I think therein lies the problem. We gotta have a better process. But then again, I, I revert back to what I said earlier. We gotta put the right leaders in place that know how to do this, that know how to motivate a workforce. When I came to the uh, uh, headquarters, Homeland Security, to run one of the first offices that I ran, which was the Office of Procurement Operations, we had 60 people on board. I was authorized 250 people, and I needed to hire quickly. I got 250 people on board in less than two years, but that's because I marshaled the troops, and we went out there and recruited. But it's hard to do with the current processes that are in yeah. place. I think that's a great point. We, we hear in this committee uh, despite some of the improvements we tried to make, like direct hiring, and by the way, some of it's agency by agency, I think it should be government-wide. Yes. We hear people uh, telling the story about having found somebody talented, and the person, after two or three weeks of waiting, gets an offer from the private sector. The private sector says, we'll hire you tomorrow with benefits, ready to go. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, we, I'd love to have joined the government and, and done some public service here, but I, I, can't, I can't wait four or five, six months. Uh, I've got I've, I've to move. So I think that's a disadvantage that, that we have. Um, Senator Peters is now back. I want to let him ask a question, but anybody, uh, Ms. Sullivan or Mr. Schneider, any responses to the hiring dilemma? Yeah, it, one thing I'd like to add and, and really highlight something Soraya mentioned earlier. I, I think we also need more flexibility to have people move in and out of government in these roles. And it is difficult for people and you know we need good strong ethics rules uh, but sometimes they are a barrier um, for many government yep. jobs but especially for contracting officers uh, who get excluded from being able to work at lots of com companies or if they work at a company are excluded from working back in the government and I think we will be able to retain more people uh, if we can allow them more flexibility to move back and forth between industry and government and gain a whole bunch of expertise at the same time and yeah, I would just point. add that 
If I can, uh, that small businesses offices at agencies are under resourced and they are incredible tools to be able to, you know, get some new small businesses into the government, keep small businesses providing innovative products. So making sure that there are enough resources for those offices uh, is incredibly important. May, may I add something to that? Because Elizabeth raises a very important point. At DHS, I think we were successful because we partnered with our Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, and I carved out positions from my staff to put into that office so that we could work in partnership to, to evolve our program. And I think our program was successful because we had it properly resourced, and I probably had one of the larger Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization in government, including that it was staffed by a senior executive mm -hmm. official. So I think that's a really important and valid point. Agencies need to focus a little bit more on their small business programs and how to bring in small businesses, and that starts with the right people talking to the small businesses. Great. Uh, my final uh, question is about federal acquisition regulations. Uh, they're often added. Uh, they are rarely uh, taken away. So uh, uh, Mr. Schneider mentioned that a second ago with regard to one. Uh, but new regulations are necessary, but obsolete rules and regulations seems to me have to be removed. So Ms. Sullivan, one of the strengths of our acquisition system is the presumption of competition, you know, to get the best value. So people have to compete with, with one another, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, based on your experience with small to mid-sized companies, what federal rules or regulations make it difficult for these smaller companies to comply or compete when doing business with the federal government, and, and what rules or regulations uh, should be removed? Um, I think that clarity is always what small businesses are seeking in any rule or regulation. And one of the issues that has been, you know, kind of plaguing the community for a long time that I had mentioned in my opening remarks is the time period from when the FAR Council issues a rule and the SBA uh, issues a final rule. So it can span many years and the acquisition community often doesn't take SBA's final rules as, you know, what they should be, which is that they should be followed until it's in the FAR. So it creates a ton of confusion and then even more regulations or more rules that have to show up after the fact because the rulemaking isn't simultaneous. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think the SBA Office of Advocacy did a nationwide tour a couple years ago, I think if I'm remembering the timetable correctly, and asked small businesses what regulations, including contractors, were really hindering them. So I'd encourage taking a look at that um, and what they found, because I, I know that they found specific ones that you know were problematic for small and honestly mid-sized companies as well. Great, well, we'll, we'll look for that. Our our capable staff is already behind us trying to find that online. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. Thanks for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, Senator uh, Portman. Uh, Ms. Correa, the, uh, the Good AI Act uh, is legislation that I worked on uh, with Ranking uh, Member Portman, uh, which would create a, an artificial intelligence hygiene working group. Uh, this group uh, of experts is, would create a means to ensure that uh, federal contractors are, are using AI properly. Uh, for the benefit of the country and that the information uh, collected through these uh, technologies uh, is not uh, mis misused. Uh, my question for you is what are, what are your thoughts on uh, developing additional contract requirements to ensure our systems are, cons uh, are secure and that uh, sensitive uh, information is being uh, protected? So I, I never oppose contract requirements that are about protecting our information, protecting our country, and protecting our citizenry. However, we need to look at those rules carefully and how they're going to impact industry. Because every time that we add rules in the federal acquisition reg regulation, we are imposing new requirements on companies, and they have to comply, and they have to demonstrate compliance. We also create additional work for the contracting officer or that acquisition workforce, both from the program as well as the procurement side. So what I would say is we just have to carefully look at these rules and make sure that we're looking at any other rules that are affected by this rule, because all too often we're also adding regulations without looking at what's already on the books, what are the, all, the compliance requirements that are already on the books. But I'm not opposed to any rules that protect our, 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 uh, our data, protect our people, and protect our government. I, I'm in, totally in favor of that. I just want to make sure that we do it right, that we're looking across the spectrum to see what else is out there. 
Mr. Snyder, Ms. Sullivan, do you have any thoughts on this matter? I mean, I, I agree. I would like to see the working group, you know, if, if they're going to propose new things that are needed, um, A, they could also propose to Senator Portman's question something that needs to go away, uh, but also there should be some requirement on them uh, to be able to explain what isn't available today within the regulations to achieve the outcome. So they should first be looking for how do the current regulations meet the, the outcomes they're seeking, um, and then look towards what new re requirements might be necessary. And Mr. Schneider actually mentioned something I was going to say earlier, which is any you know new committee or any new regulations in the cybersecurity realm, where you know securing our our um, information, the regulations between DOD and civilian agencies need to make sure that they're talking to each other, because that's been a big problem for small businesses. Is there are different agencies making really good you know changes to their requirements, but then they're not talking to each other. So then the compliance for each one gets confusing and time consuming and expensive and doesn't result in better security for you know our contractors. Right, good, good. Mr. Snyder, I, I would also in, in closing here, just um, like you to speak more about the process that you mentioned uh, in your opening statement that would allow technologies to be uh, refreshed throughout their life cycle without necessitating a new procurement. Uh, would you expand on that, please? Well, I, I think you mentioned this at the beginning, the, the fact that, you know, we, we get things that are, you know, maybe new to an agency but not new to the ecosystem um, because of some of the procurement timelines that, that we have. And so we need, you know, A, we need agility inside the procurement process to be able to have procurements uh, done quicker. Uh, the reality is those may never get to the timelines that we really want them to, to be able to acquire technologies, um, you know, on the timeline that agencies are really going to want them and that technologies, the timelines technologies are being developed. So how do we add flexibilities into those procurement vehicles that allow vendors to come in and propose technical refreshes, propose, you know, build it more at maybe the capability versus the procurement vehicle at the capability level versus the product level so that new products can be brought in to support that capability as the products evolve over time and for services as well. Mm -hmm. Ms. Gray, you have some thoughts? Uh, no, I, I agree with what Grant is saying, that uh, we do need to build that technical refresh capability, and we've done that before. It's not something new. It's just how we do it. How do we build it in there so that it is agile and flexible and it's properly interpreted by the parties? Because a lot of times that's what you really run into is how we're interpreting the rules and what we put into the contracts. Great. Well, thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, thank all of our witnesses here uh, for participating in, in today's uh, important uh, discussion. Appreciate you taking your time and for your very uh, thorough answers uh, to the questions uh, that we posed. I think this conversation has given us a, a lot of information. Uh, it's given us uh, some ideas on how we can continue to improve the uh, procurement process, especially when it comes to expanding opportunities for businesses uh, to work with the federal government, particularly small businesses, which is a priority for me and like many of the members on this uh, committee. And, and also, uh, how do we keep pace with uh, rapidly changing uh, technology? And uh, the change we've seen will likely only accelerate uh, in, the, in the years ahead. And uh, we nef definitely need to be uh, nimble uh, and creative uh, in how we approach this problem. And all three of you have given us some ideas, and we'd love to continue to work with you in the in the months, uh, months ahead. I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Portman for holding this hearing uh, with me, and uh, we all look forward to working together. This is a very bipartisan committee that rolls up our sleeves and gets things done, and this is one of those areas where we need to do that. Uh, but uh, we uh, know that uh, we're going to need to be talking to you uh, on a regular basis in order to accomplish that. The record for this hearing will remain open for 15 days until 5 p.m. on May 27, 2022, for the submission of statements and questions for the record. The hearing is now adjourned.